Something uh, so innocent and refreshing about the prayers of children, isn't there? I mean, just it's, it's fun to hear children pray and how honest they are. You could do a search, and I came up with a couple that uh, from just online websites, you know, people who posted these things. Dear God, help my parents understand that if I don't eat salad, I do better at school. God, please forgive, my, forgive me for hiding my sister's doll, and please don't tell her where it is. God, I, I, I need you to make my mom not allergic to cats, because I want to get a cat, and I don't want to ask my mom to move out. And thank you, God, for the whole world that you made. Even some of the adults are pretty useful. When I cut my forehead, the doctor was an adult, and he gave me stitches, and now my cut is better. Well, not better, but it's pretty good. So thank you for that adult. You know, and one of my favorite things, and maybe you are this way too, is to hear children pray. B- because they're more authentic than we are. <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? When I was in uh, New England uh, years back, and my kids were younger than they are now, obviously, the, one, of the, one of the boys was sick. I don't remember which one. And I had put him in the bed, and we had closed the door, and I just stood outside, and I could hear the other one praying for their brother. And I thought, what a sweet moment that is. Because that comes out of that heart of faith that, it, that they have. As children just authentically do that, it's, it's great. You know, we teach kids to talk to God like we're talking to a friend, and then we pray like we're writing a philosophy paper, you know? I mean, it's, it's amazing. But I'm reminded many, many times as I've looked at my own children, and the, and the kids around me uh, about what God is really after when he's looking at us and our relationship with him. My, I come home from wherever I'm at and I'm greeted by children who want to talk about their day. They want to tell me about something. Something they've seen, they've heard, they've done. Do you have something for me, Dad? Can I have a cookie, Dad? Mom said no. You know, I, I want to go fishing. I want to do something with you. I mean, it's just they just want to be a part of y- the relationship. They want to be there. And I, I really enjoy that because I know that at some point the kids grow up and they don't want to do that as much anymore. But so many times in that, however, God has whispered into my own heart and reminded me that this is what he is after with me, with us. He's after that relationship with us. And that when we communicate with him, we are having that relationship with him. What is on your heart? What's on my heart? God, what is on your heart? We can have that relationship and communicate together. And, you know, since we're not in control of anything, even though we think we we are, we ought to be constantly going to God. Constantly going to Him. And learning how to walk faithfully with Him. And, And to say, God, right now in this moment today, thank you for walking with me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for pouring out your mercies, your grace, your blessings. And help me to draw near to you because I need you every day, every moment. I need more faith to walk this life. I need more courage, more strength. I need provision for my daily needs. I need food on the table. I need things that I just don't have and you're going to provide. And we think also about other ways as well, like reconciliation. You can change hearts. You can change the hearts of my family. Change the hearts of my friends. People who are are distant from me, who have, have strained relationships with me. And even in a worship service like this one, it's very much a miracle this happens. It really is. <laughs> uh, how many, uh, don't raise your hands, but, uh, how many, <laughs> but how many arguments happen, have happened this morning on the way to church? I mean, how many times do you have a challenge to get to church on a Sunday morning? Maybe um, it's spouse, maybe it's kids, maybe it's just your own internal stuff. And so we pray. God, we need you to show up. We need you to draw us in. We need you to be a part of this because when you show up, people are changed. So we pray that we're ready to receive whatever he wants. And so today's core value, the next core value in our series is prayer. Prayer is the primary work of God's people. And in the flurry of activity that is the local church in our own lives as well, we need to make sure that we keep prayer as the first thing that we do, the first activity that we do. Because nothing of lasting value happens unless we pray. And so to uncover this and challenge us in this, I'd like us to turn to Exodus 14. So go back to your Old Testament there, way toward the beginning, Exodus 14, 
because any chance I get to go to the Old Testament, I do it. There's so many great images of God's love and God's care for His people, God's direction of His people, His work on their behalf, and there's lessons that we can learn to walk faithfully with Him today. And so I'm going to approach this core value by going to a place where you may not have gone to think about prayer. But I want to look at a guy named Moses. You heard of him, right? Moses was a man who communicated with God. And because he communicated with God, he was able to lead the people and walk as God had called him to walk, even when things didn't look very good. And so I want to read this. uh, Exodus chapter 14, starting in verse 1. And... Excuse me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Piharath between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal of Zephon. Pharaoh will think, The Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that Pharaoh, the people had left, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, set along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi-Harath, opposite of Baal, Zephon. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up, and there were the Egyptians. Marching after them, they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us into the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So this is right after God had appointed Moses and said, you need to go and deliver my people. Get them out of slavery. And you remember the story because um, Pharaoh didn't just say, okay, please take the slaves back. They're yours. The people are, they're gods. He he didn't like it at all. In fact, God had to show him plagues after plague after plague after plague until finally he was persuaded. But not until the firstborn sons were all killed. That first, that Passover, that first Passover there. And so Pharaoh agreed and they left and the Lord's leading them on their way. And God is showing them as they go kind of a a preparation that they are in for what's going to come next. And as we get to chapter 14, God tells Moses, okay, now take these people and put them in a specific spot. Go to this specific spot because there I'm going to display my glory. And so, of course, that's where we're at. So there are three pieces of a sort of a foundation of prayer that I want to kind of hit on this morning. Three pieces of this foundation that help us in how we pray. And the first one's this. The goal of everything is God's glory. In light of our current election season, this is timed very well. Really, because uh, we might look at our world and kind of lose hope. Get a little bit um, disillusioned with the process. And and start to wonder in despair, God, where are you in all of this? What can you do in all of this? But even in, in this passage in Exodus, we see the Israelites getting very nervous as Pharaoh shows up. And Pharaoh, being a hard hearted king, being used by God, even in his disregard and his unwillingness to surrender to God, being used by God to give God glory. Verse 4, it says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army. That would not have been a likely source, you wouldn't think. But God is going to gain glory through Pharaoh. People would have doubted God, perhaps. 
there's a battle that is going on in our world today and a battle that's going on in our minds. Opposition for God is all over the place. And, and, and of course, in Egypt, it had been everywhere. They didn't worship God. They worshiped all kinds of other things. But Pharaoh had a hard heart and God used it for his glory. So in light of all the challenges we face today, it's helpful to remember that. It's helpful to kind of go, okay, God, you can use this, whatever this is, for your glory. And he continues to do that today. Some of the things that are going on, of course, in our modern secular worldview, that's, by the way, that's not from John 14, 12, that's Oz Guinness, in his book Impossible People, said the greatest danger in coming generations will not be the extremes, but in the soft center of almost anything goes. Amiable accommodationism, which is a word I think he made up, accommodationism of current evangelicalism. In other words, we live in a very confusing time. We live in a very confusing time. What is accepted as truth or as good or as right changes almost daily. And that line of right and wrong, what appears to be right and wrong, is turning less pronounced and more perceived. Just think about that. It's becoming more about perception than about what is. But still, God can use hard hearts. And God can use hard-hearted leaders to bring Him glory. And God still can get the glory in all of your circumstances of your life and in our world and in our country. He can still get the glory and in spite of a very difficult season of politics that we've been in. How? And that's something that can be hard to see, right? How can He receive glory when there's nobody turning their face to Him? But if he can use a guy like Pharaoh to display his glory, he can use anything in any situation to do the same today. And so you might ask, okay, fine. What does that have to do with prayer? (laughs) Well, everything. Because we need to be people of prayer. Because I don't know how he's going to get the glory. I just know he's going to. And And Moses didn't have all the details of the story. He just knew that God was going to get the glory in it. Going to gain the glory in the circumstance. And so we need to pray. We need to pray for God's glory. That God is going to use anything, anyone, anywhere, anytime to bring Him glory. God, make your glory known. Bring yourself glory in this place, in this situation, in my life, in the world, in whatever is on your heart. How can this glorify God? And even more specifically, how does your life glorify God? How might God get the glory in your circumstance? Pray. Keep praying. Never stop praying. And so Pharaoh sets his sights on God's people. And God tells Moses he's going to be glorified, and so he trusts him. So everything is for God's glory. The second part is this. God's glory is amplified. Now we not only have God's glory being displayed, we have it amplified in this impossible situation. They're told to put themselves by the sea. Okay? And that's not a big deal until you're being chased by an army. And they're coming to get you and you've got nowhere to go but the water. Now it's a problem. But keep in mind, if you look back in Exodus 13 and verse 21, you see how the Lord has walked with them. It says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night by a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. God has not left his people. He's showing them the way. He's leading them to this place. And so God has been leading them and where they are now positioned, seemingly strange, seemingly kind of uh, vulnerable, was the place where God was wanting them because he was going to show up powerfully. And Moses knew this. And the people seemed okay with this until, of course, they saw Pharaoh's army on the horizon. Now it's not so good anymore. Pharaoh had changed his mind. He liked his free labor. Uh, they had accomplished a lot for him and he wanted them back. And he had somehow forgotten all these plagues and all this stuff that had just taken place. And his little change of heart had gone away and he was now after them again. So he puts together this big show of force. It says he used chariots. Chariots were, were thought to be invincible, like the biggest, the greatest, the best. He's going to bring them in, going to go and take them back. Now, The Israelites outnumbered them. I mean, like maybe 600,000 or more. I mean, there's a lot of people there. But all they had going for them was what it says in verse 8. It says uh, says in verse 8 that um, they were marching out boldly. 
So they had no military structure. They had no, nothing to fight with. They had a boldness in their march. And that was really it. But God is going to get the glory, remember. And so this tells us something about our own journey and our own life. And it's something I don't even like very much. But it's this. So you may need to get back into a corner to learn how to pray. And I know as much as we don't like that, it's very true, isn't it? God is going to get His glory. He's going to show Himself faithful to a whole bunch of people who are very weak in their faith. They, they weren't exactly excited. And He was going to use water and wind to overcome a very large army. The water and wind was going to take Him over. But, but I mean, put yourself there for a minute, though. I mean, they just left Egypt. They've been walking around the desert. They're now encamped there, and there's an army showing up. What would you do? I mean, probably what they did, we probably would kind of panic a little bit. I mean, God, you said, I know you said, but I mean, look at, I mean, look at them. They're big. This is impossible for us. But verse 11, they said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt? And listen to them. There was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us? I, I rescued you from slavery. That's what I did. I mean, just, it just the people are just so angry and so confused and, and just not sure what to, say, what to even do. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? Would have been better for us to serve them than to die in the desert. And so they're not being very rational. And Moses, in his grace, shows them all kinds of patience because I don't know that many of us would be that patient with them. I mean, look what I did for you guys and you are so ungrateful. <laughs> God has worked for you on your behalf. You've seen him do it. And now you're going to waver like this when you're backed against the wall. It's not rational. Of course, Moses was not going to bring him to the desert to die. It was not the goal. It was not the plan. It was never what was in mind. And they were slaves before. And now they're free. But easy to let the emotions get the better of us. And they longed to go back to Egypt where things were good and the food was better and... You know, at least they had a place to sleep and all that. But listen to yourselves. I mean, that's what you want to say to them, right? Listen to what you're saying. You want to go back and be a slave. You want to go back to slavery. Absurd. But see, hardship is where they're at, and hardship teaches us something. It teaches us to pray. Because they cried out to God. I mean, they got mad at Moses, of course, but they cried out to God. And in the midst of an impossible circumstance, where else do you go? But to God, the only one that could possibly do something, the only solution was a supernatural solution and they needed to pray. Fantastic lessons of our, for our faith here. I know that I, when I faced impossible situations, it's taught me to pray. Because there's those times when we go, you know what, I cannot do anything about this. I can't fix it with my own ideas and, and methods. I need God to interact and intervene in this situation. I need a supernatural solution to my problem. They were not going to be able to fight the army off. And they were not going to be able to swim across. Not all of them. Some of them would drown. But they needed to let God show up. They needed God to do something in their situation. And guess what? God is not limited by circumstances and He's not limited by unbelief. Doubts don't limit God. Only He could act. And so they cry out to God and, and they, they have Him uh, show up. want Him to show up, of course. So I wonder if you maybe feel like you're back into a corner today. You know, you feel like you're up against something that's too big. It's too big. Remember, God's glory is amplified in that because it's only uh, explanation of that of, of correcting that is only him only he can do something about that situation and when he does he gets all the glory in that take Elijah for example remember Elijah Old Testament prophet yeah sitting in the second row no not that Elijah <laughs> Elijah who uh, was a man who was ordinary living for God, walking with God. <coughs> and of course, we read a story like this. Here's 1 Kings. If you want to turn there, uh, you can. 1 Kings 17. Here's an example of this. I think this is so amazing what he did. So this is after the whole, uh, the, the big scene and the whole deal there at Mount Carmel. Actually, no, it's not. It's right before that, sorry. It's right after he was fed by ravens. He's, he's been being led by God. In chapter 17, verse 17... See, I'm at the bottom of this page. Sometime later, so here he is in the house of this widow, 
And, uh, of course, the situation changes after this son dies. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. He said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to uh, the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched out himself over the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. Talk about a desperate scene. This boy has died. This woman is now somewhat hysterical, as you can imagine. And Elijah takes him and decides to pray for him. It's a desperate place to be. Because the only way that boy is going to live is if God shows up and makes him live. And so he prays, and he prays, and he prays. And God, of course, shows up and lifts this boy up. Verse 22. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. And he picks up this child and carries him down to the room and says, Look, your son is alive. And this woman now says she knows that, that he is a man of God and that the word of God is from your mouth and is true. And see what God has done. The supernatural that he does, completely in his hands, completely without anything he could have done other than pray. And you might say, Well, I've been in an impossible place. And you know what? That boy might not have lived. The boy might not have stood up and walked away. That's true. But it also may have been God's will that Elijah pray for him so that he can live. And if he didn't pray for him, then he wasn't going to live. And so you can't look at a situation and say, well, it's impossible. It can never be done. Instead, we say, God, you can do anything. You can change anything. And so I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you for those impossible things. Ask for the big things, the things that we don't think can ever change, never can happen. We go to God and we say, God, we know that you can do this and only you can do this because we've tried <laughs> and we've failed miserably at it. We're praying with our friends in Massachusetts who are still dealing with cancer in their son, son's body. Years, five years or so now. He's now 20, 21. So going on, he was like 15. And it's cancer spreading in his body again and, and uh, it's just tough to watch. He's in pain. And they're faced with the impossible and yet they're still praying, God, we know you can change this. We know that you can heal him. And we're going to keep praying and keep praying and keep praying until either you know, he, he's healed physically here or he's with you. But either way, we're going to pray because you can do the impossible. And that's what this is about. Right here, right now in our community are people who are dealing with all kinds of issues. Addictions to drugs, depression, debt, health problems of all different kinds, family conflicts, broken homes hurting people everywhere. And, where. and so what is the role of Christ's church? Especially when a lot of us are those hurting people. What do we do? We pray. We, God, teach us to pray. Teach us how to pray. Teach us what to pray. Help us to understand that you are the God who can do the impossible. Bring me closer to your heart because I can't see how this can be better and how you can get the glory in this. Impossible situations demand a supernatural response by God. So let's be praying in those. Now, sometimes we don't get our answer we hope for, but you know we do get every time, is the presence of God. He doesn't leave us. He walks with us. He leads them. He continues to lead them in this story. He goes behind them and protects them as they then go to the water and they start to walk. God does that for us. So don't lose hope. So God brought them to the banks of the sea. They're crying out to God. And the people are, of course, not real sure how this is going to work out. And Moses says this, verse 13, Do not be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance of the Lord today. Verse 14, The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And here is this third and final foundation for us today, and that is this. God's work for his people requires a firm stance from his people. A firm stance from his people. When the army is closing in, what does Moses tell them? 
It's going to be ahead of myself. Moses tells them what? Prepare for battle? No, it doesn't say that. Does he say run? Panic? Loot the shops? You know, I, I mean, he doesn't say any of those things. Instead he says, be still. The hardest thing to do, to be still. Stand firm. Let the Lord fight to you. And to be fair to Moses, again, Moses didn't know the exact details of the plan. God didn't say, I'm going to do this. Not yet. He won't in a minute. But he knew that God would protect them. And he was just reminding the people, God will protect you. God will take care of you. And then he goes on. Verse 15 now. We haven't read this yet. Verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will gain glory through the Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So, this has not been done before. I mean, this is like, I mean, this is, this is like, this, you haven't done this before for us, God. Go to the sea and stand there and I'm going to lead you across. Moses is going to raise up his staff and it's going to just go. It's going to take a while. Not like you see in the movie, right? It doesn't just go... Whoosh. But it, it says that the wind blows all night long and, and it, it opens it up. And they walk on dry ground. A supernatural work of God. Moses did his part. And now it was like they prayed and God said, okay, now you've got to do. Right? There's action now that comes as we pray. Sometimes it's like we pray, we pray, we pray. God says, go... And that means go. That means now it's time to act and do and, and walk out in faith because he has told us to do so. So think of a time when you, God told you to stand firm. I can always think of these times when I've been told by God to kind of stand firm and, and it goes usually with also keep your mouth shut. <laughs> usually it kind of goes together. Don't talk. Don't talk. Times that I've been criticized or treated unfairly and wanted to correct, fight back, and God's told me, be quiet. Stand firm in my word, who you are in my word, and be quiet and trust me to take care of these things. And trust me to do that. He knows the things that you're going through. He knows the things that you've had happen to you that are unfair or seem unfair to you. And that needs to be okay. It's harder to say that. It's easier to, to, to say that, I should say, than to do that. But spiritual maturity demands that we do that. And we think of Jesus Christ as well. We look at him and we say, look at what he has done. And look at the, the battle and the, the fight that he has had for our soul. And that he has gone to the cross and he has given his life so we can know him. And we're told to stand firm, to believe, to trust in him. Because he is ready to enter our homes and our lives and our families and all of our situations if we just let him in. But it's not always easy. And the reason is because we are in the same place in many ways as the, as the Israelites were here. See, when we're once we're in slavery to sin, right? You're, you're living in slavery and you're experiencing all that's going on with slavery. And you know, that's what sin does to us. It puts us into the control of the devil and his work, his influence. And then Jesus Christ comes and he rescues us from that place of slavery. And Jesus Christ is far more powerful than the devil is by a long shot, but we still deal with some of the influence, right? We have a flesh that's still bent away from God. We've got a world that's under the influence and the, the direction of the prince of darkness, as the Bible tells us, the prince of this world. And so we, we, we deal with this, this kind of this struggle. And, and the, the ground that is given up to Jesus is not given up easily by the devil. He wants it back. And so he'll come after us. I mean, I mean, it happens all the time. He comes after us. He comes after our, our lives, our families. He comes after our, our own heart and mind and says, oh, you're not good enough. You're not worth this. And he'll give you all kinds of reasons why you need to go back and give in and go back and be in slavery again. But what does God tell us? Stand firm. Stand firm in his word. Stand firm in the Savior, Jesus Christ, who came, died, rose again, and gave us a place to stand. Ephesians chapter 6. He says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. i got to get to the right one. There we go. Against heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground, and after you are done, you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Look how many times he says to stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in his power. Stand your ground, and when you've done everything to stand, stand firm. Probably pretty important to, to know this. Pretty important for us to stand firm. The battle is for the souls of man, and it's a continuum battle. There's a battle at work in our hearts and minds. And, and as we walk this world, we, we feel it, we experience it, we see it all over the place. The battle is real. And Jesus died for, for mankind, but mankind just you know, walks around in this darkness. There's a veil over their face that we need to, to see removed. And this firm stands by us in the church to say, no, Jesus is real. And he's alive and he can do this in your life is where we need to go. That prayer stance, that prays for our city and our family and our friends and our neighbors. And even as we come to something like this uh, November of blessing to say, God, can you do something in this that, that would be just outside of what we could ever imagine? Because we are available and open to standing firm in your word and believing that you, in fact, want to work in impossible situations. That you want to do this. I used to sing with my kids I don't do this much anymore now because they've gotten older and don't want to hear me sing, apparently. But I've, so I, I've decided to follow Jesus. We went to bed at night. I've decided to follow Jesus. And you know that, that second verse that says, Though none go with me, still I will follow. I wanted to get that into their minds. That you know what? Sometime in your life, you may see everybody else going a different direction. But will you follow Jesus? Will you stand firm? And live that life that says, I will go, I will follow, even if none go with me. Remember in John chapter 6, and the, the story of all these people who are following Jesus around, and suddenly he starts teaching things they kind of don't like, and they all turn around and walk away. And Jesus looks at his disciples, he says, are you guys going to go too? And what do they say? Where will we go? You have the, li- the words of eternal life. You have salvation. They have nowhere else to go. And I pray that's us as well. And as we pray, as we stand firm in his word, as we look at the impossible and say, God, I don't get it, but where else am I going to go? And I pray that that be us. That no matter what happens, no matter how difficult it gets, that we stand firm. And we be people who pray and not waver. So what then do we do? Well, here's kind of to wrap this up. Maybe kind of the three points as ways we can apply this. One is to pray for God's glory. Remember your life, and as tough as it might be, that God is going to get the glory. How? Mysterious to us sometimes. But he will. He used Pharaoh's hard heart to bring him glory. He's going to use your situation, your past, your present, all those things for his glory. Pray for God's glory in those impossible situations. And pray that God would do something. And don't be afraid to pray that he will do something. Because, uh, you know, maybe you need to be the one to pray. Maybe that's his will for, for you. Finally, pray for the ability to stand firm. And this, again, comes right from this text. The hardest thing for them to do would be to stand firm and to believe God's going to show up. And, um, and he did. He told them. He led them there. But as you pray, watch for what God is going to do and how he will be present in your life, good or bad, feast or famine, that he works for his people when they pray. So then will you join me in a word of prayer? God, we thank you for the example that Moses sets here. I think we probably can relate with the people. As we look at our world and we look at the state of the church in America, we look at the state of our own lives, our own homes perhaps, and we say, I don't, I don't understand where you're at in all this. But Lord, we know that you are here, that you are with us, that you are walking with us and you haven't left us. And Lord, you call us to pray. You want us to pray. May we be people who pray for those impossible things. Lord, we pray for things like revival in America as crazy as that maybe seems in our minds, but we know that you can do it and you can do anything. And we pray for that. We pray that you would in our own hearts cause us to see your glory on display. 
as we fight our own internal battles of sin, depression, anxiety, the issues of life, the daily struggles to even just make ends meet. Lord, help us to see your glory and to stand firm in the truth of your word to know that what is said about us, what is done to us, that's not who we are. Who we are is in you, firmly placed in Christ. We thank you for that. And we pray now that as we prepare our hearts for this time at the table, we're reminded of that foundation that you set for us. That you went to the cross. That you took that, that beating and that, that pain and this, the, the sorrow and everything, the sin of the world, and you put it on yourself and you died. And you did that for me. You did that for us. So that we can walk faithfully. That we can walk in freedom. And not go back to that place of slavery again. But to be free and to live that. Lead us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a, a song. Please stand.